I talk to a lot of interesting people on my podcast. I'm at episode 215 now. There's been a lot of cool people, but I think John McDavid just became one of my favorites. So John is the quintessential creative type. And in this episode, we talk all about creativity and mainly his journey. And his journey honestly is fascinating. I could have listened to it for hours. He went from Hollywood to airbrushing t-shirts and making a living out of it, to working in the toy industry, to being an illustrator. And what I really like about John is that he's He's got the one quality that I think is the most important for any creative, curiosity. And he's retained his curiosity throughout his entire career, even up to the point now where he's um, he's in church, he's working in church as a, uh, I can't remember the exact term he used, might have been preacher, but he preaches a lot on this episode. And it's just fascinating to listen to. I barely say anything in this episode and I just let John talk. He's got a lot of fascinating stories. He's a really interesting guy. So if you're interested in creativity, if you're interested as well about how to actually make a career out of being creative, John's got all the answers and his stories are just bloody fascinating to listen to. So yeah, this is episode 215 with John McDavid. Cue the music. Just learn, you learn uh, a, a great lesson the first time because of what you didn't know. <laughs> and I, I had to edit every single cough. I mean, it was a lot of work. Oh my but God. It was good. It was good. So, how many episodes are you in now? How many have you done? You're number 60. Oh, wow. Quite You're a few. 60. So, so just, just, over, just over a year. And what's the kind of biggest things you've learned from it? Oh, man. Um, I would say I would say that encouragement is as great as anything. It's 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 watering plant. Encouragement waters the creative. I mean, encouragement waters anybody. And and then. Um it seems like people decide that they're going to do it. And once the decision is made, it doesn't make everything easier, but it makes, it makes most things intentional. Yeah. It's almost like once that, that, that is decided, everything else just happens. What you mean encouragement from the listeners or the, the people you interview? Well, I mean the decision, the, the person making the decision. Once they decide, hey, I'm going to go after this. I Just listening to you, listening to your, your uh, interview or my interview of you. And, you know, you talked about being scattered and that you didn't have, you know, any obvious creative medium that you worked in. Mm. But but like your superpower uh, was, was your interest and your desire to learn and your desire to commit. And then, and then you just, you just rolled through things, you know, you put, you put your head down like a rhino and you go Mm. and, and, and that doesn't mean, I, I don't get the sense from you that, that you're, you're, you know, the hell with everything kind of a guy, but you're, you're uh, steadfast and you're just going to keep going after, after your thing. And, you know, you're not, you're not worried about, and I share this with you. And I think many people who, who have pursued uh, their, their career, their interests uh, have done the same as, is, uh, let me turn this off for goodness sake, is um they're not afraid to look a fool or fail for a moment. I heard somebody put it so spectacularly well this morning that um, we often refer to uh, mistakes or errors or setbacks as failures. And they're really, they're just hurdles. They're hurdles. And, and you have to decide, you know, he didn't say this part, but you have to decide, are they, are they, are they hurdles or are they, forever roadblocks 
Mm. A big difference. I think what it comes from for me, and I, I feel like I've already hit record. I feel like we, we need to continue now. We, we, we're already fantastic. We're, Let's do it. We're already into this. Um, I, f- I feel like for me, it isn't really putting other things aside or being steadfast and forgetting about everything else. It's a curiosity thing. I think we probably talked about this on your podcast. It's just a simple fact of I see a thing and I'm like, I've got to do it. I, I've got to give it a try. I, I've, I've got to go at it and see if I enjoy it. And it's a little bit like when you meet somebody for the first time and you say, oh, oh what, what are you into or, or what are you doing? It's usually young people. And they're like, oh, I'm, I don't really like anything. I'm not really interested in anything. And you're like, why, why don't you just go, just go and try some stuff? It's a little bit like that with me, but it's pathological. It's the other way around. I just, <laughs> I just want to do everything, explore everything, see everything, try everything, particularly creativity wise, because there, there isn't really one medium that bores me particularly. So I just want yeah. to go go out them all. Yeah, you you talked about you talked about your parents supporting you in in your pursuit, and then you brought up a mentor who you're still in touch with. And I think I think those mentors. Uh, I I don't think this. I I I I I, I believe we're lost without them. Mm. You know, there's only so far you can get. And you need, you need somebody, you need somebody who's ahead of you to, to, uh, stop and put a hand back and to help you along. And, you know, you may reach a, a level with that mentor where they become a peer, you know, or a friend or, um, but, but we need that, that, um, that, that person ahead of us who, who has, has been through the wars, right. Who is, who is, made made as many or more errors right than you have and they're willing they're willing to uh vulnerably lead you i mean i don't know that they all do it vulnerably but i think they expose their vulnerabilities it's it's like you know just uh li- lifting up the the hood of the car to show you how things work mm. and you know i remember my dad was a mechanic and he'd tell me now if you're ever wearing a tie don't lean over a running engine. And, uh, you know, I haven't seen anybody work on a car who's wearing a tie, but he was old school. So perhaps, but you need, you need someone to help you along. Who was your mentor? Who was your creative mentor? Um, so I'm really fortunate in that I had, I had several along the way. And one, the first one was my, my father and he, um, he, he was a, a Brit. He was from north of London and he was a, um, a machine repairman for a locomotive uh, part of General Motors. And he moved from, from north London to uh, Chicago. And he was also very creative and he also, he liked me. You know, he didn't just love me. He liked me. He wanted to be around me yeah. and he was so much fun and he was very creative. And so he, when I was a little kid, he'd bring me out in the garage and he'd, he'd pull out the oxycetylene torches and he'd get a flame going and he'd have different colored rods of glass and we'd melt the glass into shapes or we'd be working on ceramics. Uh, he built a kiln out in the garage, but he was always encouraging me with that. And he also encouraged me to, um, to, to try, try to pick something to make a living at that I would really enjoy because I'm going to be doing that for the majority of my life. And I loved art and it was never really a question for me as a child that I was going to be an artist. And, and when I was six, he took us to see star Wars at the theater. And I mean, as a little kid, he said it, my dad was a, a math guy, a numbers guy. And, and as we were getting ready to go to the theater, he, he, uh, he sells Star Wars to the family as it's set in the zeros, <laughs> which we were all like, what does that mean? First off. So my dad must have read a long time ago, right? In a galaxy far, far away. And he went, it was set in the zeros. And so, you know, we're a misery getting to the theater 
and, and we're sitting there and then, you know, the screen goes black and I can still, I remember the feeling of, of seeing that ship come in off the corner of the screen and, you know, a six year old, I'd never seen anything like that, but no one had ever seen anything like that. That was, that was like a miracle up on the screen. And then the cantina sequence popped on and then, you know, you have all the, the swashbuckling and romance and everything, everything that poured into me. And in that was, was stuff that I wanted. I wanted to somehow live that. And then uh, my, my mom was a, a horror movie fan. So she'd have me this little kid watching her horror movies with her, which were, you know, much tamer than they are today. Right. But, um, I, I, the folks took me to see a, an American werewolf in London in 1980 or 81. It all comes back to London, Craig. <laughs> um, and there's the, the showstopper in the middle of that. And I don't know how many people have seen it anymore. Uh, cause I'll, I'll, I'll be speaking with younger folks and, and they don't, they don't know uh, of it, but there's, there's an in camera, meaning no digital effects transformation in the middle of the movie that is just astonishing by Rick Baker. And I left the theater. And so that would have been 1980. I would have been nine. It's not a movie for a nine year old, by the way. <laughs> and, and I left the theater and I remember, I remember thinking to myself that I want whatever that was, I want to do that. And so my teen years became about pursuing special effects makeup. And that's where, my next major mentor comes in and that is Dick Smith who's since passed away. He's, he passed about five years ago. I think he was 94 and uh, Dick was uh, a makeup artist who uh, really bridged the gap between old Hollywood and new Hollywood. And he bridged the gap because he was in New York. He was NBC's first makeup artist um, as a matter of fact, I believe they still use all of his color makeup today. Wow. Uh, and, and he, he kind of made it up as he went along, but he ended up after film or after television, he went into film. And so he did, he did the makeup effects for taxi driver and the Godfather films. And then the big one, uh, well, I guess some people would say the Godfather was the big one, but the exorcist was his. And Godfather's yeah, boring, uh, though, isn't it? It's well, so you get to the second one, right? <laughs> the second one, there's a lot going in, but but it also shows the difference in filmmaking. Like I'll I'll watch Star Wars once in a while, and and my son is like, "This is so slow," and yeah. I'll be sitting with him, going, "Yeah, it is kind of slow, isn't it?" <laughs> and then you see everything nowadays. Everything's racing past, yeah. or you get these fast cuts, but it's a sign of the times. Um, but uh, you know, Dick had done the exorcist and then he just shared all his knowledge with, with, um, all of these, <clears throat> our young artists out in Hollywood and all around the world. And <clears throat> the reason why the prosthetics are so amazing is that he, he was generous. So if we, if we're talking about, uh, the exorcist, for example, for anybody who doesn't understand what makeup is, Obviously, we're not talking about just dabbing on a bit of eyeliner on somebody's eyes here. What right. what kind of stuff did he do on the exercise? Well, it was prosthetic makeup, so I would say those those were some of the... I mean, it, it was... I wouldn't say that it was standard, but it was a pretty straightforward approach that he used with the prosthetics on, on uh, the... I can't think of the actress's name right now, the young girl. Linda, um, but Linda Blair. Linda Blair. Linda Blair? Yeah. Linda, Blair? Yeah, Linda Blair, Blair, I think it is, yeah. But... But then there was also, you know, the famous head spinning, <laughs> right? And um, and so Dick had made this mannequin where that the head would spin. And because because it was in the early seventies, they were shooting, and filmmaking was entirely different than it is today. And there was a different level of awareness of people shooting things. Um, he he couldn't leave the mannequin where the head spun on set. Cause it, if it walked off, you know, it was weeks and weeks of work. He'd have to make a new one. So 
he also hadn't constructed it so that he could break it down and throw it in the trunk. So it sat in the passenger seat of the car <laughs> and the head was on ball bearings. So as he's sitting in Manhattan, driving from his home to the, the, the set, um, the head would just turn and look out at people and traffic and people would be horrified. Uh, but I just, I love, I love that. Uh, that's, that's how he had to do it. But, you know, so there was, there was the, uh, the mannequin itself. There, there were other, you know, crazy reverse effects that he did where, um, you know, her, her belly, like what raises up, they shot it in reverse was the words help me, mm. you know, as the girl is crying out for, for help from the possession. And, um, but he, he, he gave all of that information away to uh, people who, who were worthy of it, people who reached out to him. And I, I guess that's what I mean by worthy, right? Is they reached out to him and he wanted to pass it along. And so when I was 15, I started calling all these effect shops in Hollywood. And, you know, I was remarking about your dulcet tones, your deep voice. <laughs> and, you know, as a 15 year old, my voice was like this. And I'd be chatting with somebody at the studio for a little bit. And, and then they would gather that I wasn't some 30 year old guy, right? They'd okay. say, wait, wait a second. How old are you? I'm 15. Oh, okay. And they would all tell me you need to talk to Dick Smith. Yeah. So I called Dick Smith up. I found out where he was at in New York. I called him up and his wife answered and she said, well, he's not here. He's in, he's in Chicago, which is where I lived. Uh, and, and I said, Oh, I'm in Chicago. And she said, let me take your number. I'll have him call you. And I thought, well, okay, I'm never going to hear from him. Well, I had driver's ed the next morning. And when I returned home, my, my mother told me, don't go anywhere. Dick Smith has called five times this morning. I said, what? And so he called me back and a sixth time. And I remember him saying to me, listen, I'm not going to, and I'm excited. Right. And he's trying to get me to calm down a bit. And, and I just remember him saying, um, I'm not going to promise you that, that you're going to be an artist or a special effects makeup artist, but I'll take a look at your work and I'll be honest. And then he said to me, the only difference between you and me is I've made more mistakes. And I mean, I think about a 65 year old Oscar winning artist passing that on to a 15 year old that he doesn't even know that he called five times because I wasn't around and he's on set busy doing stuff. Yeah. That's a special person. And so I studied under him and um, we became friends over the years. I'd go visit him here and there. And uh, it led to me going to LA to interview with effect studios. And I also had this other weird situation, our fortunate situation where I was dating this girl who's a volleyball player <laughs> And uh, she was in club volleyball, so it was pretty serious stuff. And uh, her coach would see guys hanging around the girls, right? And he's like, okay, what do these kids want? So he would, he would make it his, his point to get to know these guys and kind of shoo them off if they were no good. And he asked me, you know, what am I interested in? Just like you talked about earlier, talking to somebody, what are you interested in? Yeah. And I said, well, I really, I want to be a special effects makeup artist. I would tell anybody who would hear me <laughs> at that age, this is what I want to do. Isn't it cool? And uh, he said, well, you know, my, my brother-in-law is in charge of all the props at uh, Lucasfilm wow. at Skywalker ranch. Would you like me to put you in, in touch with him? And I said, well, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> so, it was about three years later, I was 21, I believe, I flew out with my buddy Wayne and uh, we flew into LA and we immediately flew up to San Francisco. And a couple of days later, I was standing in on the property of Skywalker Ranch. And I'm up by all the map paintings and all the, there's the Ark of the Covenant and there's, I'm wearing Indiana Jones jacket and there's Darth Vader's helmet and there's all the models. And I mean, I'm just salivating over all this stuff. And then a couple hours later, I'm standing in George Lucas's office and he was, he was gone for the day. I remember, I think somebody had said he hurt his wrist or something. He had to go get his wrist taken care of. 
And I, I'm looking around, I'm like, how did I get here? Like, how did I get to this place? This is crazy. And I, I had this overwhelming uh, feeling and, and belief that I could get anywhere now. I can do anything. And, and I don't mean it as like, it was, it was humble. Like I was overwhelmed by it, but I thought all I've got to do is be intentional and I can get somewhere. And so I had, I went and interviewed them with ILM, which is Lucasfilm's effects company. And that was a, a really great visit. And, and I interviewed with other effects houses and they, they, the majority of them had said, look, if you move out here, we'll, we'll give you work when work comes, but it, it didn't work. Like you'd get the job and then move out. That's, that's not how it worked. And there was one effects house I wanted to work for. And that was Rick Baker who'd done American Werewolf in London. And he was my last interview and I was so nervous. I remember he, he came out, I'm, I'm sitting in this kind of little, it was like a meeting foyer and, and it had all of his work. So it had like all the Eddie Murphy movies where he's dipped multiple characters because yeah. he'd done coming to America. There's uh, Michael Jackson's thriller. He had done um, gorillas in the mist, all these gorillas. And, and he sat and, you know, he asked me how, Dick Smith was and you know we chatted about that because Dick was his mentor and and um and then he he leafed through my portfolio and about 20 minutes into it his assistant came out she said Rick we need you in the back and uh he said excuse me a minute and I said I said nope I said thank you very much I appreciate your time you've been fantastic and he said just wait a second <laughs> and so that was his ringer right? If, if he wanted to get out of it, I'm assuming it was his ringer. It's yeah. like, uh, it's not going well, just come in 20 minutes. So then another door opens up and it's his, it was like Willy Wonka, right? Walking into his office and there's, um, there's Harry and the Henderson's head from, you know, the Bigfoot. Yeah. And I asked him, you know, wow, how, how do the, how do the mechanics work in that? And he just peeled the skin back on it and he showed me everything. And then, you know, I'm, looking around all the amazing things in his office. And he threw me a, a brick of clay and, and he said, sculpt a wrinkle for me. So I got a loop tool and I sculpted a wrinkle. And he said, uh, he said, I sculpt wrinkles like that. He said, a lot of the guys in the studio don't sculpt wrinkles like that. You sculpt wrinkles like me, which was kind of cool and generous. Right. And then uh, after, after a while, he's like, all right, it was kind of like, sit down kid. Let me tell you about Hollywood. And, um, you know, my portfolio was not where it needed to be to work for him at that point, but I just wanted to get in. And I remember uh, um, he asked me what I wanted and I said, I'm here to work for you. I don't want to work for anybody else. I want to work for you at your studio. Um, I think you're the best. I want to work with the best for the best. And you know, he let me down very gently. He, he had his guys and his uh, ladies and everybody who worked all in order. And, uh, you know, he was 40 and he had a couple of kids he was raising and he didn't really have it in his bandwidth to train me. Um, uh, and so, you know, I walked away from that and I decided I'm not going to move to LA. Like I would have moved if Rick Baker had said, yes, I would have done lived on the streets or whatever. Um, but I wasn't, I wasn't disappointed by that because I, I had an opportunity and I went and I put all my cards on the table. All you can do is try, right. Mm. And get yourself into, into proximity and then ask. And, and so when I returned home, I was trying to decide what to do next. And I realized I didn't want to do special effects makeup for a living. And I, I had always been a, a very strong illustrator. And so that was something I was pursuing. I was making a living airbrushing t-shirts to make a really good living airbrushing t-shirts. It's crazy. And um, I fell in with these toy designers, with these sculptors, I guess, Chicago in the sixties through well today, there's lots of toy invention shops here, studios and all of my special effects background was like it was like a, a cousin of toy design mm. and product development and i got into these studios and we're designing happy meal toys and 
things for Hasbro or uh, Mattel and, and uh, slot machines and, you know, all of these things, some of them very organic, some of them very industrial. And what I found is, is that I was a good sculptor. Uh, I was a good designer, but I was really good with a pencil. Hmm. I could, I could, uh, I could recover quickly from errors. I could meet the demands of the parameters set by Disney or, or anybody, any license. And then I could originate views of things. We want Darth Vader doing this arm up, doing this over here, uh, meet the requirements. And, and I liked it. it. I was efficient. It was fun. And I loved working with the studios. And then I was starting to make some money. And, and so, uh, then I had this, I got this big mural job that I, I did. It was like 108 feet of mural. And I took all the, the, the money from that or a portion of the, the money from that, that I'd earned. And I invested into a Mac and I got this $3,000 computer and it's sitting on my table. I'm like, what am I going to do with this? I don't know what I'm going to do with this. I remember I thought it didn't work properly because I hadn't plugged in the B for the RGB cord. So I just had the red and the green. I'm like, Oh, this is a mess. And then got that sorted out. And, and then I started to work uh, with other product development companies um, digitally. And then, then the internet really came along and then that that's where I grew. I grew my business. It was, it was really good. It was a, re- it was a good season. It's been a good season for a long time. I, I've got questions to ask about toys and things like that, but I, I, I've had a question on my lips for about 10 minutes. So it's just so fascinating to just let, just let you talk about that. It's amazing. But the main question I had, so you, we get to the point where you buy a Mac. How old would you have you been at that point? 22, 23? Older. No, no, no. It was, uh, it was, 99 so i would have been 28 okay so if we, so if we row back a little bit to the to the interviews in hollywood the hollywood interviews the the thing you didn't really mention is how you learned your craft so what so what were you doing to to learn the craft at that point well i don't i don't think i learned it well enough because i didn't get hired <laughs> um you know, I, I was, so, so Dick Smith, I graduated high school and my, my folks would have sent me to a four-year university, but I wasn't interested. And it's not because I wasn't a good student. I was a very good student. Mm. I was not interested. I, I was, I was interested in being an artist. I was interested in entrepreneurship. I, every art school that I even, I, I mean, my folks didn't really understand the American education system. Uh, Some people might say nobody does. Um, But I wasn't interested in going to paint pears and peaches somewhere. Mm. I, I, I had an experience uh, in a, a, we have a, a junior college here and and so you can get your like your first two years in, or you can get a, associate's degrees and all. And I, I went to this college uh, to stay on my folks' insurance, and I took an art course, and it was drawing one hundred and one or something basic. And um, I probably had I, I I had issues. I was probably a hard a hard art student to lead. I don't I don't think <laughs> I I think I was pretty judgmental. Um, but this teacher was having us do, you know, two point perspective drawings, three point perspectives, then do a two point perspective of a de- or three point of perspective of this desk. Yeah. And so we all had our desks. And then she said, let's take our desks now and turn our desks into something else and put it into a different environment, like a TV in outer space. So everybody had these TVs in outer space. Well, I took my desk and I turned it into a fiery cauldron and it was in a cave and there was this like skeletal cobra made up of human bone, you know, all this stuff. And it wasn't, it wasn't to her liking. And I remember her saying to me that doesn't, that, that cauldron doesn't look like a desk. 
And I, I replied by saying, well, I don't think these TVs look like desks. Isn't that the point? Mm. And, and she said, no. And I remember <laughs> at that point I said, okay. And I was polite to her and I didn't say any more to her. I just, I took my D <laughs> on, on that drawing. And I said, you know what? I am going to do, I'm, I'm just going to take business courses from now on. I'm going to figure out the art thing on my own and I'm going to take accounting. I'm going to take business law. I'm going to take uh, um, management. I'm going to take entrepreneur classes. I just, I focused on business. And, and so before that, to, to kind of come back around your question, um, I drew all day when I was a kid. And then my, my dad would take me out to buy plaster and I bought alginate, which is the soft material that you could cast faces with. And, and then I learned how to make a cast of a face and then pour the plaster into that uh, casting and then to take the face and then uh, to set that up with a sealant so that I could sculpt uh, prosthetics on it to change the look of somebody so that I could then soak that in water and float those pieces off and then make all the separate uh, molds off of that face to make a base for the clay so that I could... Uh, get the edges and seams down to then make a casting of that. So when I took that apart and scraped the clay out, the bottom part had the cheek of somebody's real face in it. And the negative had a casting of what the old age makeup or whatever it would be would look like. And then when you put those together, you have that open space and you would fill that with foam latex and bake it in the oven. And so my poor mother had this oven that stunk of rubber, right? And and then you take it apart and then now you've got a prosthetic piece to use. Yeah. And it was it was much more intensive than my personality at the time was was uh, able to focus on. I would say it was very undisciplined. And I liked to draw concept sketches. I loved the idea of things. We probably most of us fall into that right the idea is wonderful yeah. and then the actual execution is a different animal entirely so you were kind of just learning stuff picking up things trying it maybe for a few weeks obsessively and then probably getting a little bit bored with that and then moving on to something else until you found basically Completely. until you found drawing basically or illustration and that was the thing yeah I, and you know, airbrushing, really, that was the tool that set me free because I, I was out of high school. I had no money. I did not want to get a regular job anywhere that felt like death to me. Mm. So I had this airbrush and airbrushing T-shirts was a thing in 89. And so I started airbrushing T-shirts and I sold a couple. And then there were some shops around and I, I fell in with this one shop. All you need is a chance, right? And yeah. and these people brought me along. And then uh, about about a year and a half into it, I, I was doing my own thing connected to a shop in a mall. And I was, I think I was 20. And I, I made 11,000 American dollars in a month uh, over Christmas. Wow. And I mean, I worked for it and I was sick as a dog after. And I mean, it was, yeah. I don't think it was healthy, yeah. but, but I mean, as a 20 year old, it like blew my mind. It was like, I, again, you remember when I said with American Wealth of London, this, whatever this is, I want this. It was like business wise. I was like this, like, like I made money. I can, I think I can do this. It was just proof of concept coming to be. So you, you were never kind of just free range creative you were always looking kind of as a way to make it a job as well which i think is quite unusual especially for somebody so young yeah i think because of my dad telling me um you know you might want to figure out what you want to do because you're going to have to make a living at it for the majority of your life it might as well be something you enjoy that really limited my the options in my mind and the other thing my dad told me, I must have been in middle school, maybe, maybe early high school. I remember him telling me, hey, hey, he called me Johnny. Johnny, I make a good living. And he made a good living, he said, but I trade, I trade my time for money. Don't trade your time for money. Trade your skills for money. 
and I don't even know what it meant at the time to, <laughs> to my, you know, young brain, but it, it, it lived, it resided inside of me long enough that it became part of me. And so I was, I was just this guy who was always thinking, how can I make a, make a living from what I do? And that, that helped me to stay independent because I was constantly looking for opportunities to provide value to clients. Mm. And I knew if I could provide value, if I could solve problems, and then if I could package it in a manner that made it ridiculously simple for my clients, where they wouldn't even have to think about the project anymore. Like I would be so on top of it, they'd hear from me before I heard from them asking. Mm. Uh, And then if I was easy to work with and pleasant, I mean, all of that just added up to um, a living. Mm. And then, so you, so you did the, the airbrushing t-shirts. Um, how long did you do that for? So I airbrushed t-shirts for about six years, I think. And then I had this crazy, another crazy happenstance. Uh, I'm in airbrushing and I'm, I'm kind of done at this point. I don't feel like airbrushing t-shirts anymore. I'm 24 or five or something. There's only so many, you know, uh, teddy bears with Gina loves Ted. You can paint in them, right? <laughs> and that's what I felt like at the time. I They are near and dear to me still that, that now looking back. But this, uh, you know, when you airbrushed out at, at a mall, you, you, the idea is foot traffic. And the idea is also that it's an impulse buy because it's, it's fun. It's unusual. Mm. And you, you would have eyes on you and you could kind of feel the eyes. So I feel somebody's eyes on me and I look a little bit over my shoulder and it's this 40 something year old guy with, um, with a tweed jacket on and he's really just watching me. And so I always initiate, I often initiated anyway, how are you doing? Good, good. How are you? Good. What, can I interest you in a shirt or can I answer any questions? No, no, no. And I'm just airbrushing. And he says, Hey, why do you use those, uh, those Pache airbrushes? And I thought, okay, well, he knows what I'm using. That's interesting. And so I, I remember the first thought I had was, what do you care? <laughs> <laughs> but then I said, well, it's what I've got. They're really good. They're reliable. And he says, you know, you should use Badger airbrushes. And he pulls out of his coat <laughs> a Badger <laughs> airbrush and he hands it to me. And he says, uh, I'm Ken Schlattfeld from Badger airbrush. <laughs> and, uh, I really, I really like your airbrush. And would you come in and have a meeting with me on Monday morning? And I said, yeah. And he gave me his card and off he went. And I went in and I had a meeting with Ken and I walked out with a retainer. I was getting going to be paid monthly to be on call for him mm-hmm. and his company. And, and so, you know, through Badger Airbrush, I, I, I learned about, what, what a retainer is, the benefits that come with that. And I had all the airbrush equipment I could ever want to put my hands on. And then he'd call me on a Wednesday and say, Hey, can you fly to LA next Thursday for a couple of days? Sure. Can you fly? I got to We got to go to Germany for toy fairy. We're going to go for a week. You up for that? Yep. And so I got to see a chunk of the States and some of the world. And I, I had this relationship with them for 10 years and, you know, I'd go out and meet with the, uh, uh, I wouldn't say explicitly to meet, but I had met like the CEOs of major retailers that were selling their, their product and Badger, Badger felt comfortable sending me to engage with them just to not to sell anything, but mm. just to show them how it works, how easy it is. And, and, uh, I, I just have an interest in people doing well too, you know, like, uh, I mean, we're in pandemic times and it's a weird time, but you know, the best way to show someone how to use an airbrush is, is literally to ask them, Hey, can I put my hand over your hand? And then I'm going to tell you, relax, relax all your hand muscles. And I'm going to show you how it feels to paint and how to, to achieve certain effects. And, and that was just such an incredible way to transfer the experience to someone so yeah what what i really like about that badger story about you know you were 
airbrushing t-shirts in the mall and a guy walks up to you and sees potential uh it's 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 like it feels like it should be a movie or something but what what i really like about it is it's this thing that a lot of people miss um with their creativity be whatever it is writing or being an artist or being a designer or or musician or whatever so many people just won't put themselves out there i mean the the modern day mall is usually twitter instagram it's even easier than ever you don't have to set mm-hmm. up as you don't have to set up a stall on any of these things. Well, you do. It's a digital one, but it's very, very easy to set up. I mean, it took it took some bravery to do it in a mall, do it in front of people, and all that kind of thing. And then an opportunity was almost inevitably going to arise because you you had eyeballs on your work every single day. But so many people just won't dare do that. And I, I know I know good artists. Who, who won't even set up an Instagram profile um, because they're just scared of what's going to happen. You know, it, I can't think of any negative that happened in that situation. You know, I think, I think life can be really hard. Um, you know, my... I, I had the the benefit of a father who who really poured into me, who was a good man, who was interested in me, and um, I, I I I don't know that that everyone. Well, I know for certain not everyone has that. And then to be to be a personality type where I'm I'm an extrovert. And I, I've, I've probably always been more confident than I should be. Um, but you know, my competency grew over time and, and, uh, and I, I, I think, I think that one of the, the, you, you brought it up. One of the biggest problems is, is, is a fear of venturing out into the world whether it be at the mall or online or wherever it is that you're going to do it, because now you're exposed, mm. you know? Um, I felt that when I started my show and, and I was nervous to hit that button and I'm, and I'm like, I'm not afraid of stuff like that, yeah. but, but it was like, I, there was just something about, it was like, okay, it's going to be out there now. And, um, yeah, I think I think it's hard. I think I think that's why if somebody's stuck, if if they're not making progress in some way, I think they need to stop and take a look at what what is what is the the hurdle they need to get over? What is stopping them? What is penning them in? Because chances are it's it's probably got something to do with your childhood or your family. There's something. There's something there that that is is in your subconscious that needs to be dealt with. And, and yeah, my heart goes out to anybody who's stuck right now because it takes work to get out and it takes uh, intentionality to get out of it, to get past it. I, and it can be painful. Sorry. Yeah, no, no, it's, no, it's a really good point. I, I remember feeling the same way when, when I first started my podcast and at that point in 2017, when I started my podcast, I'd already done a lot of other things online. I had a public Twitter profile, I had a public Instagram profile, not many followers, but I was making stuff out in the public. But there was just something different with a podcast. And I guess this is the, the same with any creative pursuit, because I'd never done it before. I'd never put myself out there in that way before. Nobody had never heard. Uh, nobody had ever heard my voice before. There's all these kind of weird things go, going on with it. So the first step was putting your voice on a recording, and also then getting comfortable to hear your own voice to edit it, and and then being comfortable putting it out there. There's a lot of hurdles just in that one thing. And then when you think about the extra hurdles, maybe I'm going to put it on YouTube now. Well, now I've got to get comfortable with my face being on on the internet the truth is not many people watch it or see it but there's just a thing about it being on the internet isn't there there's the potential 
for 7 billion. Obviously, there isn't 7 billion people with the internet, but there's potential for billions of people to see it. The truth is that billions of people won't, but there's something in that, both negatively and positively. When the potential there is for 7 billion people to see it, it makes you a little bit scared. But also on the flip side, when the potential for 7 billion people to see it, it only takes one person, like your Badger story, to see the work, go, yes, this is exactly what I want. I want to work with that person. And I, I think that's what's really the magic about putting your creative work out there, that you just never know where it's going to lead. It, it sounds like your life has been full of that, those opportunities. Oh, oh yeah. I remember reading a quote from... Uh, back to the godfather who directed it francis ford coppola and <laughs> somebody had had asked him are are you worried about the opportunities that you've missed in your life and he said he said no i'm i'm much more thrilled about the opportunities that i've caught and that i've then pursued and you know i think that's that's another kind of inherent uh piece of leverage I have in my makeup is that I'm an optimist and it doesn't mean I'm all, always optimistic or feeling good, but I know the sun's coming up tomorrow and I got a new day to go at it. If today was absolutely terrible, yeah. I, I, I just believe that. And I, and I think, I think, you know, a fortunate thing for me is growing up in the seventies, we didn't have television like we do today, we had a couple of channels, right? And those were fuzzy. And, and, you know, my dad worked a lot and my, my, I was an only in a lot of ways. I have an older sister, but she was almost out of the house by the time I was born. And, and I think drawing saved me in a lot of ways, drawing and story. So Star Wars and horror movies and story really, really saved me from, things that probably could have, could have tipped the ship. And I think they set me up, you know, seeing stories and loving stories and seeing that there's, there's always a challenge ahead for the main character, for the protagonist. And, and, and I, I don't think that I was uh, aware of it, but I think in my subconscious, I went, well, this is just how it is. There's going to be a challenge. And so now I've got to overcome it. And I remember having in my mind, uh, if, if there's a wall in front of me, I'm going to climb it. If I can't climb it, I'll go around it. If I can't go around it, I'll dig under it. If I can't dig under it, I'll run through it. I'll, I will just kept on running through uh, options that I might have to press forward. And, and so, yeah, it was, uh, it was, it's, it's, you know, I don't want anybody else's life. I've, I've enjoyed, I've enjoyed uh, all the ups and downs and the, and the downs have made me, resilient mm. well I think you've made a career out of being creative and I, I honestly I doing the same I can't think of a better way to make a living mm -mm. Um, obviously I don't have the experience of any any other living you know my long-term girlfriend's a police officer I know I don't want to do that for a job anymore um, I know other people who've got other jobs but I genuinely can't think of another thing that I would want to do with my time. Yeah. So, you know, one of the richest things too, I think about, about my, my career is not just that I've been able to create, but the people that I've met along the way, I, I have so many uh, close relationships and then people that I'm just fond of who I've worked with in my business that, that I'll run through a wall for them because of our relationship. Mm. And, and, you know, it's made, I didn't see that coming when I was younger. I didn't see that part of it. And that, that might be the better part of it. I don't know. I don't know. That's probably a whole other hour though. <laughs> well, I, th I think in the hero story of John, we need to bring this, around to the other bit of the story that I kind of forced you to skip over, which is the toy stuff, which we didn't talk yeah, about. Yeah, please. Other people are going to ask about that, especially when I cut you off. So <laughs> where, where did that fit in with the airbrushing T-shirts? Was Did that come after the airbrushing T-shirts? Or when did the toy so, opportunity turn up? 
So there was this guy who would come to a, a mall that I was airbrushing at. His name was Dave. So another guy, and just another, another guy. Another guy. <laughs> and he'd, he'd pop by and he'd say, that's really cool. And he was really encouraging. And then off he'd go. And I wouldn't <laughs> see him for a few weeks. And he'd pop in, hey, you know, and he, he'd say hello for a little while. And he was a bigger than life character. Yeah. And um, he was he was a heavy metal drummer who was a sculptor. And wow, they are really opposite skills, those aren't they? One of them is bashing drums really hard and fast, and the other one is being very delicate. Well, it's funny because he, you know, a lot of toy sculptors work in wax, so so it's a hard, you know, material to work in. Right. I mean, you could make it softer, but he would work uh, uh, in this hard material. And whenever he would draw with a pencil, it wouldn't be a minute, and he'd snap the lead <laughs> like he just couldn't. He like, Ah, he snapped. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're going, and he'd he'd be drawn again. But I, I uh, was asked by him at one point, "Will you come in and we we help me cast this kid's head?" And I said, "Sure." So it was this young guy from high school who needed a face cast for it was a friend of the family or something. So I came in and did that. Well, he had his studio was on the third floor of a hundred year old limestone church building, and and. And much of the building was vacant, so it felt like a horror movie, like I was walking into a Hammer horror movie. <laughs> and I, I went up the stairs, and at the top of the stairs, I can't go any further. There's a garage door there. I'm like, what the heck is a garage door doing here? And I, I knock on it. Hang on, hang on. <laughs> and this door rolls back. And Willy Wonka again, right? There's there's a design studio in here, and there's a mill in the back, and there's drawing stations and sculpting stations and a molding station and uh, a jigsaw and, you know, oh, my goodness. And I, so I walk in, and, you know, we cast this guy's face, and Dave's, Dave's a little anxious that I'm my eyes are on everything, right, because the toy industry is very uh, – uh, discreet about sharing anything. So um, he had me back up to airbrush something for him. And then we, we slowly developed this relationship and, and he, you know, knew that I was interested and had a background in special effects makeup. And uh, at some point I remembered saying to him, cause he, he seemed concerned that I could sculpt and draw. And I was kind of getting an idea of who his clients were and I, I said, I said, Dave, let me make a deal with you. I said, uh, how about I'll stop sculpting? I'll stop taking sculpting clients on. Because I wasn't as interested in sculpting at that point. I didn't want to buy a mill. I didn't want all the equipment, a lot of overhead. Uh, I said, and, and I'll help you sculpt if you need, whatever. But why don't you give me all of your drawing work and all of your design work? And if I have anybody come to me, I'll give you any work that they need something made, a sculpture, anything like that. And so we forged this a handshake relationship where I became his, his hands and eyes as far as all that stuff for the clients. And I also, you know, would provide him with clients who were after three-dimensional work, but that ended up being work for me anyway. And, and so I, I had this relationship with this guy who, who was my best friend for, for decades. And, and then he also was into, into the haunted attraction industry. He wanted, he did a haunted house. And so we built this. And when I say we, like there were welders and, and uh, electrician and, illustrator designer for the marketing and then for the rooms and then we painted the rooms and then I recorded all the voiceovers for the rooms because it was all going to be mechanized and then I would airbrush 30 people every night and it was a timed haunted attraction every every room was about two minutes yeah. and then we had two spots in there where there could be a holding tank for groups if something broke and we'd be open for five hours or so and we'd have four or five hour lines outside. And then I started to entertain people in the line. 
I'd airbrush my face up and I go out and I was actually I stumbled on to the Scottish zombie. So, I, you know, I was uh, they talking like this to, and they didn't, didn't know what I was saying. And, and it was just fun and, and a blast. And it was, it was another, you know, running into this one guy changed my life. It may be more directly than anybody else had. Um, and, and it was, uh, it was a great season of life. Yeah. So, uh, toy, toy was interesting because you might have a concept that needed to be done for and I'm going to go back to the nineties, uh, for Disney's hunchback of Notre Dame, right? Notre Dame. And, and we'd need, we'd need to figure out four concepts for some happy meal toys. And now I didn't know if this was a meeting that, that, the client had had with Dave or not, or if he was trying to pitch for work or what it was, but we need to come up with a toy that could be made within the parameters of the costs necessary to produce these things in fast numbers. And then, you know, maybe, maybe the hunchback, he would, his, his arm would go down. And if his arm went down, maybe, maybe the uh, gargoyles would pop up behind him and they'd go back. And then maybe Esmeralda, if if uh, you hit a button on the bottom, she'd turn and she'd hit her ta- tambourine. My set's falling apart. <laughs> they'd hit the tambourine and then and then there'd be like a little bell or a, a chime that would go off inside of it. And so then I would create these these uh, sketches of of the romantic image of each of the products. Right, this is what it could look like. And then the next step might be: All right, give me a front view, a side view, a back view, a top view. And sometimes you'd have to do both side views because if the character is doing this, you need, you need this and you need this for, for the sculptor. Yeah. And, um, and then I would draw mechanisms as well. And I, I don't, I'm not a mechanism guy, but I would sit with Dave and he would say, okay, so we've got a cog here and we do this and that. And then I would draw it to a point where it, it conveyed the mechanism and then he could convey that to the client and then the next step might be okay w- we got the job uh we got to sculpt this thing so he would generally do that or have his guys do that and then uh they'd make the molds and then they'd have castings that would come out and then a lot of times i would do the paint jobs so i would have to mix and match the paints to disney's pms tones to their chips and and you know that that was an art in itself to learn, you know, to match. And you're, you've got you got a white piece of plastic, and you're holding it next to the PMS three forty nine blue, and you're mixing some black in, and you're blow drying it because acrylic always dries darker, and, and you've got to get it right on. And you know, it just became another skill that I picked up, and I was able to use the airbrush a lot of times in in that in that part of the world as well. And then once I became digital you know i started to use that in toy design and then we had a couple of opportunities pop up with clients who who offered us royalties based on um potential you know to they they'd give us some money to develop something and then nothing ever caught with that which was it was still fun to do but you know there's there's possibilities with royalties and royalties can be ridiculously good money Oh, I thought you was going to tell some story then where you invented some kind of toy and, and now you're a, a, a secret, maybe you are a secret millionaire. You wouldn't I, be. I wish, I wish. <laughs> I'm a, uh, uh, it's, uh, I've, I've had some good times with royalties, but not, not that good. <laughs> if only, hopefully, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> so that's the toy stuff. Where does that leave you today? What, what's the main well, creative pursuit today and what's the lessons we could take away from this? So uh, I still do quite a bit of product development for clients. Um, and that can be, that can range from conceptual uh, for, for internal meetings, conceptual for marketing and sales. Depends who you're de- dealing with. If you're dealing with a sales driven company, you can get a call at five in the evening and got a meeting with Walmart tomorrow. We need this drawing. Can you do this drawing? Everybody's frantic. Sure. Um, 
and you know, that's, that's, that can be where you make your money, right? Because it's all about, it's all about helping people out of their problems. Um, so pr- product development, uh, uh, you know, design of just about anything from packaging to wraps, to labels, to, to kind of mundane things, to very exciting things, uh, to public art and murals. I still do. Um, I, I am, I am an illustrator, uh, a guy who likes to draw by, by nature. And, and basically if somebody has an issue that, that can be solved through visual communication, uh, I, I can generally help mm-hmm. and I'm, I'm thrilled to do it. So I work in illustrator, I work in Photoshop. I work a lot in procreate now on the iPad that lets me be just about anywhere at any time. I love that. And then, um, uh, kind of out of left field. I don't think you know this one about me and you can decide if you want to go down this road or not. But <laughs> I, I, uh, got into ministry about, about 10 years ago and I've been pastoring a church. So I, I preach like every, every couple of weeks or so. Oh, I can tell you've been preaching for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> so I have, you know, I just kind of, I'll, I'll go, I'll go where, where I think I'm supposed to go mm. and do what I'm supposed to do. So it's, it's, uh, it's good stuff. I, I think one thing I really love about you after listening to you speak about all that for this last hour, you've got a very similar attitude to me when it comes to being creative and probably life as well, to be honest, that you just kind of do the things that interest you. And I know that sounds really basic, but it is so rare to find somebody these days, especially when they've been doing a thing for a long time, when they've been doing a skill for a long time. The the thing that people tell you that you should do is, so you were an illustrator or a drawer, as you put it, you should be just focusing down one very specific skill within that range. So maybe you'd be a technical artist now, for houses or something like that. That's the path that we're told we should go down. And I'm a designer by trade, so really all I should be doing is, I don't know, designing websites or logos or whatever. But we've both done the same thing where we just do a thing because we want to do it. And we, we follow wherever that goes, wherever that might end up leaving us. Sometimes it's a success, sometimes it's a failure, sometimes it's somewhere in the middle but you've done the same thing and it sounds like you're still doing it to this day where, and I think that's the most important part of creativity is just keeping that curiosity and just following it wherever it goes. I agree. I, I think, I think that um, I'm, I'm a, a weird mix of uh, optimism, pragmatism and, and uh, romance. <laughs> and, and I like, I like to go, I like to go into areas where I'm delighted by something and it, it could be, it could be a person or a personality. It could be a particular project or, um, who knows, who knows what it is. But if I find some delight and opportunity there, uh, I'm, I'm in. Is it a delight in the opportunity? Is that the way that you'd put it? Or is it curiosity? What's the thing? What's the one thing? Well, yeah, isn't it? Those are kind of together, right? I mean, like curiosity lights me up. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, I had, I had, and uh, you can cut this if, if it doesn't work in here, but <laughs> I, I got a call a couple of years ago from a client and I hadn't, I hadn't, she wasn't at the same company where I'd met her. She was somewhere else. I hadn't heard from her in a while. And she asked me if I'd come in and brainstorm. And so I was going to be there for their brainstorm meeting with all of their, their CEOs and VPs and all the head honchos. And there were going to be nine of us in this room. And the idea is, is that I was going to stand at a whiteboard and kind of take visual notes as well as, you know, write words down and concepts, but make visual notes of things. And uh, it was going to be for the morning. And I gave her my rate and, and, I loved her as a client. She's so cool to work with. And so I, I show up 
and we have a coffee and then it's time to go in and we're in for um, 20 minutes. We're in this meeting and somebody says, uh, so, so wait, why are we doing this? Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, this is interesting. And then they said, well, cause we kind of did this already. So why are we doing this? So, so the meeting started to shift right away. And once it started, you know, once I heard those words, that was a cue for me to go, okay, I really need to pay attention now. Like I need to pay a, a deeper attention than usual because there's a lot moving now. There are a lot of pieces moving and, and I want to be helpful. And it could have been that I, there was no opportunity for me to be helpful, but that's not what happened uh, because they started into down, down a new path of brainstorming something different from what had been intended. And I remember my client said, well, why don't I get up and take some notes? And I said, nope. I said, (laughs) why don't you sit down? Because I wanted to be at least somehow useful, right? I said, let me get up and I'll take notes. And I, apart from just understanding what their product was by looking at it and seeing it, I, I didn't really know anything else about the company. And so what happened is, is I became, I became a, a, a lightning rod for the ideas that they poured out. So I could say, hang on one second, can you explain that to me? And then they would explain and I would make a note or I would give it back to them and say, I'm hearing you say this, is this what it is? Yes, no, fix it, do the. And then I took notes and then we came, we ended up coming up with stories. We wrote five different stories for product and and when it ended, it was five at night. So I'd been there the, the whole day. And then I was going to render uh, kind of Mad Men ad style uh, these five different stories for two days later, which, which that turned into a whole different thing because my client's grandmother passed away the next day unexpectedly. And now she had asked me, will I, will I work with the team? So I'm working with the team. And what I realized in the midst of working with the team is I now have five bosses Mm -hmm. all with, with the same interest, but from a different vantage point. And so I had to, to navigate that. And then, you know, I, I remember I reached out to her because we're friends too. And I said, Hey, uh, so who's my boss? Who do you want me to listen to? And she said, I'm your boss send all your communications to me and I'll make sure it gets filtered out. So I, I remember I, I didn't have answers on things and like the, the parameter of the deadline is closing and I'm like, I've got to manage a print shop across the States to print this stuff. And I have to have it to them by a certain time because people are flying out to this uh, city and, and this state and they got to pick the stuff up. And, 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 you know, my goal is, not to let anybody know that it's as difficult as it is, right? Short of calling them up and saying, hey, we got a real issue here, or I I need this uh, uh, sorted out. Like I need this info. Can you get me this info? And so it was chaos and behind the scenes, but nobody knew it was chaos. And that's part of my job, right? And and so I remember the print shop wouldn't receive my, my, you know, 100 megabyte images because they wouldn't fit onto their, um, uh, their little site to transfer them to their port. And I'm like, look, you, I got to send this file to you. I'm on the phone with this guy and he says, well, we can't open up outside files that don't come through our port. I said, listen, I said, I got people flying in. I, I have no reason to attach any bugs or fire and anything nasty to surprise you. And you know where I'm at and you know who I am. I need you to open this. And I said, I will go to the ends of the earth with you <laughs> if, if you get into trouble. And, and so thank goodness the guy, cause I don't know that I would open it if I was him, but he opened it and he did the work and everything went well. And then, you know, nobody questions then when you send the huge invoice in for the work that you've done. Mm. So, so, you know, I, I would say some of the delight in that is, is the problems to overcome and then to read the different personalities and to read the different 
uh, perspectives from the different seats in the room and try to satisfy as best I can everybody along the way while taking care of my client who's got a personal tragedy happening while managing some unsi- unseen print shop way across the world. <laughs> and and it was just like there's something about being on the edge of the knife that's like, exciting you know this could this could go either way but it usually doesn't go the bad way and yet you're able to guide it in which you know and maybe just one last point you poor guy you're trying to wrap this up um (laughs) is that i'm a pretty easygoing guy and i like to have fun and i like i like to draw and paint and i like to hang out and talk about stuff like this and then inside of me there's also this driven taskmaster that that is like, and I don't mean like a judge, like we all have the judge that calls us posers or whatever, but the judge that's looking at the work I'm doing and going, nope, that eye's a little off. You got to move that back. You got to push this up. It's doing an hour. Push, push, push. There's there's like a an aggressor inside of me, but but it works for me. And I think, I think if we're going to get stuff done, we have to have that. We have to have that, that I don't even know what to call it apart from a driven admin with a whip or something inside of me. That's like, okay, this isn't right. This has got to be fixed, Hmm. but it's not like a critic or a judge that's going, you're no good. You're no good. It's like helpful. Hmm. Does that resonate for you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's a it's a standard, isn't it? You've, you've got to got to have a standard, a creative standard, or a production standard, or or whatever it, whatever it is. There's been lots of times when I've been working on jobs, usually with print companies, where the standard's not high enough or whatever, and you need to get into difficult conversations. And it, it's it's not that you you know being a taskmaster or someone nasty or whatever, but the standard's not high enough. And you know it's not high enough. And you're batting, batting the court, batting the court, batting the ball for your client. That You're the in-between yeah. in that situation. And there's been times for me like that where I've had to find a different print company at the end of it. I've had print companies say, we can't make it this green. Like, why not? It's just a color. Why Why can't you make it this green? You're, you're, a, you're a lithographic print house. Surely you can make any color that I tell you to. It's not like I'm asking you to go off the CMYK scale. I've got it printed on another sheet of paper here. The green is possible on paper. Uh, so there's like those kind of situations. And it isn't necessarily a yeah taskmaster as such. It's just a standard. And I, I think there's some people who let that standard go sometimes. And they just want to get the job done. No matter what. You know, they, they, they're going to hit the deadline. They're going to get the job done. And they think that's enough. And then there's other people, maybe a little bit like me and you, where they'll push right up until the last second of the deadline to make sure that the, the standard is the, the standard that they expect and want. And I, I've been in situations where I've been in cellars, in in buildings, and trying to do a photo shoot in three days, and it has to be done in three days. And I'm fiddling around with things that I should not be fiddling around with, taking a photo of hundred times when it was good enough at the at the second time and i know that the, the deadline's sinking and i've only got three days but it's just a standard because you know you have the creative vision in your head and you want to achieve it and you see it uh it's like an intangible thing isn't it and i i'm uh i often ask those kind of questions of people at work and people get pissed off at me when i i'm always the guy who brings it up Oh well, this sh- shouldn't that just be a just like like a a little bit? <laughs> it's fine, Craig. No, no, but it should just no. It's fine, Craig. No, 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 no. no it needs to just be just a little. T- t- no, it's fine. I don't often win those battles, but you know. It's well, there's a there's like you said, there's a standard, and I would say that as as I've as I've g- gone through my career, I I think I've learned. I've learned kind of where to let things go. Right. Cause there's yes. a, cause there's a standard, there's your standard. And then maybe there's your perfectionist standard or mine, I'll say. Yeah. And then there's, where's the client at? 
what are they paying? When is it due? All, all, you've got to, you, yeah. all that stuff. If people say that that doesn't come into play, it, it does. And I'm not saying that you should short shrift the, the quality for that, but I'm saying that reality pragmatically comes into play and, and it's got to end at some point. Yes. So you do your best with what you got. Yeah, and I think often the only way you become a professional creative particularly is by knowing the good enough line. Uh, mm-hmm. The good enough line is usually a bit higher than what the client expects, potentially sometimes a bit lower than what you expect, but it, it's good enough within the range of what you do. I mean, I remember the, the photo shoot that I'm referring to. I was melting things in my oven to make these icicle things for days before that photo shoot i lost out massively on that you know in in terms of my time and everything but there was just like a it was the first time i'd ever done anything like that and i just wanted it to be good because i'd stepped into a world that i wasn't experienced in uh you know i've done photo shoots and things like that before this was a jewelry photo shoot particularly uh and I was stepping into a new realm and I was nervous that I wasn't going to do a good enough job. So there was a, there, there was like an extra level I thought, felt like I needed to bring to it. So I was, yeah, melting stuff in, in ovens. Uh, I was melting those little wedding crystal things <laughs> to make, to make icicles. Cause it, it was a winter jewelry brochure and I wanted, and I wanted ice, but I didn't want ice. Cause I, I, I knew, well, you can't work with ice very long. And I, I knew I'd, I'd be taking a hundred photos of one piece. So I, I, I spent like a weekend melting wedding crystals and I, I just had boxes of wedding crystals that I was ordering off Amazon, just spending like, did you keep, did you order a budgie to sit in the corner so that when it fell off the perch, you'd know it's time to get out of the house <laughs> the chemicals. <laughs> oh yeah. That's awesome though. But, but you know, you're trying, you're trying to, to answer the bell. Right. And it's, it's exciting and you're doing your best and you venture into strange territory sometimes. Yeah. Well, in that situation, all the work was up front. So I, yeah. the, the whole point was I do all the work up front and then there'd be no stress on me for the three days. When we got asked to do it again, I did it the other way around and the, <laughs> the other way around. The idea was it was a winter brochure again, a jewelry brochure, but this time I was going to use paper. So I was going to use a particular kind of paper that, I, that I'd found that looked nice. It had a nice texture on it that sh- shot really nice with photos. But all I did was just take down a couple of rolls of, of this particular card paper in blue and white. And then on on the foot, the fo- well, in the cellar, not the photo set or anything, in the cellar, I was cutting out these pieces of paper. And I've always been really crap at arts and crafts as well. So I was live making these sets uh, that I'd just not pre-planned at all in the same three days. Oh my God, that was <laughs> like the worst three days of, of, of my life. You just, every every five minutes, you, you, you're just going between thinking you can't do it, making something amazing, thinking you can't do it, making something amazing, and seeing the deadline tick down, and also handling £30,000 worth of jewellery in one piece. That I, yeah. That's what you live for, though, isn't it? It's pretty much sometimes. It, it you, you in the middle of it, it's it's awful, right? And then you get through it, and it's like it might still be awful for a while, but then then you've learned stuff, and you've learned stuff about yourself, and then you've got an amazing story to share, right? Yeah, and that's that's fun. Like I I so wish that we didn't we weren't separated by the ocean and by the pandemic. It'd be fun just to to you know, go down the street and sit and chat and have a meal and a beer. And that would be, I love that. That That's some of this, like, I really enjoyed interviewing you for my show and, and I, I love artists. I love getting to know people and I, it would be, it'd be fun to, to, to just have more of that. That's good stuff. It's coming. It's coming back. It's coming back soon. Cheers I'll, to that. Yeah. Yeah. I'll definitely be over there when I can. So I guess we should wrap up. Uh, let me start playing sure. this. So you've got a minute on the time. I'll give you thirty seconds or so. Have you, do you want to plug? Do you want to plug anything or say anything? Sure. Uh, so I, I would just say if if you if you got something you're supposed to go do, just just get about the business of doing it. 
don't don't um don't be frightened to to fail and then um if you want to see cray uh my interview with him you can go <laughs> over to the breakthrough creative which is on youtube and uh it's a podcast show as well and it's about the business of art and the art of business love it thanks craig thanks a lot man we'll definitely talk again hopefully see you in person soon and i'll see you cheers soon. i'd love that i love yeah. that yeah